Namaskar. I am extremely delighted to participate in this function which has been organized in memory of Dr. V. N. Videkar. Many of you would have heard of the brilliant philosopher Shankara, so who established Advaita Vedanta. I was reminded of a certain phrase which Shankara uses in a text called Prashnottar Ratna Malika. As the name itself indicates, we ask a few questions and we give very big answers. So there, one of the questions which has been asked by Shankara is, where should a person put effort? Putra vidheyo yatra. Of course, one need not instruct anybody to put effort for uh, yapping money, for eating, for bathing and so on and so forth. These are all mundane things. But some other things wherein one has to seriously orient his efforts is what is meant by the question and uh, the answer is Vidyakhyase Sadaushate Dhani So three things have been listed by Shankara wherein a person has to put concerted efforts to see that he is able to contribute towards these. One is Vidyakhyasa so which is quite evident. And the other is Sadau Shatham and the third is Dana. So when I thought of uh, Dr. Vien Videkar, it seems he has contributed to all the three. So he himself being a doctor by profession, right? And uh, he has been in charge of the growth. So now we see the book being released, the same thing grows into a tree. So the kind of efforts which have gone in in bringing this institution from 15 people to 15,000 people today. So this is the second aspect. The third aspect is of course, so unless one is willing to share, dana doesn't necessarily mean sharing the money which one possesses, but it also includes the care that one shows in bringing up the institution, the time which he puts, which is more important than the physical resources. So, I offer my humble venerations to this great personality and I am also delighted that uh, such memorial lectures are being organized. In fact, it is essential for us to recount the deeds done by these people in order to provide some kind of motivation for the future generation in building these kind of institutions to greater heights. So with these uh, introductory remarks, I once again thank Dr. Baker for inviting me to deliver this lecture. So in connection with the other book which seems to have been released, which I of course do not understand much of Marathi, uh, but as I understand, so this is a closer look into China from uh, religious, societal and educational perspectives. So, Dharmi, Samaji, Saishani, Kambiwa, Pritik Shep. So, this seems to be the title of this book and uh, I recall something uh, in this connection based on my recent visit to China. I was there last month, uh, towards the last week of July. So, this is in connection with uh, what we need to do and the topic of my lecture too. So I thought I'll just spend a couple of minutes sharing with you the kind of initiatives which have been taken by China in trying to make the younger generation aware of their own scientific and technological abilities. So the Chinese Academy of Sciences, it is a body like DST kind of thing in India. So there is an institute which has been exclusively devoted so which they call as INHS, so Institute for Natural History, INHS, Institute for History of Natural Sciences. So a lot of initiatives have been taken by Chinese to see, again, that they bring back to court 
to central states their own scientific and technological heritage and make their entire generation aware of their own contribution. This is something which is very essential which is missing, particularly in India. So we have had a rich scientific and technological heritage and of course these are the two most ancient civilizations which have almost taken over uh, the entire world trade some 300 400 years before. 400 years before. So this uh, important aspect so has not been brought to fore, particularly the, the scientific contribution which has been made by Indians to the younger generation. This is essential in order to build a certain pride, which is not a baseless pride and it should never be hyperbole also, one has to be extremely cautious in presenting, but if one were not to present, then I think it uh, doesn't build the necessary confidence in oneself. So psychologically this makes a lot of impact and I believe that one of the reasons for Chinese progress in the past couple of years is this kind of initiative which has been taken by them. So it is in this connection, so I thought of presenting a certain aspect, so it is a very crucial aspect in the development of science. So the title of my talk is the need for the advent of calculus in India. So this has a certain implication so that calculus had its foundational basis in India. Calculus as a research aid. So if today we have progressed scientifically as well as technologically it was because of this particular aspect which played a key role in our understanding of each. So calculus is the basis so of both physics as it got developed and of course a lot of mathematics. So it has to do with uh, our understanding of trying to handle the infinitesimal and infinite together. So this is the crux of calculus and at the moment the word calculus is uttered to any of modern students. <coughs> The names that come to our mind are Newton and Leibniz. So beyond that, we cannot think of any other civilization which has contributed towards this. But as history reveals, we understand today that almost all the foundations which built this edifice of calculus seem to have evolved here almost 300 years before Newton and Leibniz. So they were in the 17th century. There was a brilliant mathematician called Mathava. This Mathava he is supposed to be the founder of what is described as Kerala School of Mathematics today. So that's why I have uh, given the subtitle to Madhava to Shankara Varya. So the period of Madhava is the later half of 14th century. And uh, Shankara Varya so has been in the 16th century. And this period has been extremely productive in India, both in terms of the concept of the astronomical, cosmological picture as well as in terms of the foundations of what, are known, what is known as infinitesimal calculus today. So with this introduction, I would uh, provide a brief outline of my talk. So initially we will uh, list a few 
mathematicians who contributed to this and what was the motivation in making this discovery and then we move on to this zero and infinity so the zero and infinity seem to be so simple today but if we deeply ponder so the very constant is quite bizarre so zero as a number behaves completely different from any other number do you agree why so this number either makes all other number collapse or if you divide it makes the number blow up into something so not any other number has behavior which is similar to this so take two numbers make a product of it either it increases or decreases so depending upon what number is going to take the what but the moment you bring it zero what will be the number that you have so the moment it interacts with that either it makes it collapse into nothing or it makes it to blow into infinity kind of thing so this number see zero and infinity cannot be separated so they do go together in fact that's why somebody titled a text so he said zero and then a dangerous idea so this is a dangerous idea it is in this sense so that's a very interesting thing and uh, calculus as such so in fact i expected more of uh, students here so i prepared the talk to be more technically so but i will try to see if it that i don't get into more of technical aspect but to give you some flavor of uh, how this field got developed and why it got developed so this uh, together with the concept of what is known as limit so zero infinity or rather i would say infinite sum infinite and limit so these two bundle together is what is called calculus and once you untie all the three are unfolded simultaneously and we have the entire thing uncovering itself <coughs> so we will see how this concept got developed here and in what context it was developed uh, so following madhava in that tradition so there were a few astronomers and mathematicians in fact astronomy and mathematics were not treated as separate disciplines so most of the mathematics in india are developed in the context of solving a certain problem in astronomy so astronomy in fact uh, as a discipline was extremely important and in ancient days it is actually described as kala vidhana shastra so jyotish shastra should not be misconstrued as astrology so astrology is only a certain part of it so astronomy and astrology as well as mathematics sort of put together was what was called as of course we have a separate thing called gurita shastra today but if we go back to ancient literature so the classification of vedanta also Because only Jyotisha means it, not Gadita. So Gadita is considered to be a part of Jyotisha. In fact, if you look at any of these ancient texts, the text of Arya, the text of uh, so Brahma Gupta, etc. So all of them deal with uh, astronomy, but a uh, significant portion of the text will be uh, devoted to discuss all the necessary mathematics, and then they will want to discuss. So here. Uh, Nirakantha was one of the brilliant astronomers so who came up with uh, a certain planetary model in which he explicitly mentioned that all the planets move around sun and the sun along with the planets moves around the earth. In fact, this was considered to be a landmark in the history of astronomy. So initially, people did not have a very clear picture as to how things are moving. you only see some uh, spots in the sky and in order to give a cosmological model it's not a simple thing 
So this was one of the brilliant discoveries. Nina Kanta also discussed a lot of mathematical details in this uh, uh, text called Aryabhati of Bhashya, which has been a commentary on the text Aryabhata composed for most thousand years. It's a brilliant commentary which has been detailed which has not been fully studied today. <coughs> so then Nina Kanta discusses also the irrationality of pi. So pi so most of us, what is the value of pi? 22 upon 7. Is it an exact value or is it an approximate value? It's approximate value. What is the exact value? Can it be stable or cannot be stable? Can you write pi is equal to something? Or can you write only pi is approximately equal to Approximately equal. So, is equal to something, when is it possible? When it is rational. When it is rational. So, it is irrational number. Okay. Irrational means you cannot express as ratio of two numbers, right? It cannot be expressed as ratio of two numbers. Let us not express as ratio of two numbers, but let us try to express it as some some other number will go on. You can keep on writing it. Will it end or will it never end? The decimal part. Till now it has gone. Till now? Huh? Till now it Till now. Mm -hmm. Till now means tomorrow it is possible. <laughs> Good. I am very happy that. Uh, yeah, people have uh, written programs. Okay. So there is a group which is working on, on developing hardware and software only to compute the value of pi correct to trillions of decimal places. So there are people who are interested. And in fact, this is used to test the position of machine in the other way around. Anyway, so this is an interesting exercise which is going on. But uh, if you were to describe pi not in terms of some number, so as physical quantity, so how would you visualize it as? In what context does this number arise? Somebody just thought of some number or this is something which has to do with uh, some geometrical picture which we have in mind. Huh? Ah, circumference. circumference. Yeah. So it is basically the ratio of circumference to the diameter of the circle, right? Circumference to the diameter. So these are some interesting quantities. So physical quantities, you have a circle and uh, there is a certain measure for the circumference and you have a diameter. So the ratio of these two I am interested in. So it turns out that this ratio cannot be expressed with an equality sign. So people have been trying for various centuries. So to declare it as irrational, you should have a scientific basis. How do you know? After some million places, then you get exactly how many? So after million places. So you should have a rigorous way of establishing that it is almost impossible for you to express as the ratio of two numbers. So this kind of a discussion has been made uh, by what do you mean by irrationality? Why should you call it irrational and so on and so forth? It is a very interesting discussion. Uh, this has been made by Nila Kanta while commenting on a verse which has been given by Aryabhata which gives the value of pi correct to four decimal places. So many of you will be aware that Aryabhata was an astronomer and mathematician who lived in 5th century AD. So to be more precise, he composed this monumental plate is called Aryabhatiya and uh, this was done when he was 23 years old and the year is 499 AD. Okay. So this was the uh, important text and the first text which is available in its full form to us today. See many of these texts are lost <coughs> over centuries. So they have uh, 
lost their existence and today certain references are available, texts are not available. And if you go to any of these Meristate library is also the pathetic condition in which they are maintained. So, makes you easily understand how you would have lost many of these things, etc. Anyway, so this uh, fortunately we have uh, preserved this brilliant commentary of uh, Nilakantha, which has been printed about 30-50 uh, years ago in three volumes over a period of time. So, 70 years ago was the first volume. And uh, this commentary includes a daily discussion on the verses of Aryabhadiya. Aryabhadiya is a very short treatise, in fact, but the content is really profound. And uh, it's hardly contains around 100 verses, 108 plus some 13 verses to be more precise. So it can be printed in uh, some year for sheet, in small font if you print, so both sides are the full But it has a lot of mathematical as well as astronomical content. So for which three volume commentary has been written by the other part. So here then also discusses about uh, the sum of some infinite geometric series. So we have series. So some are some are arithmetic series, geometric series, and so on. And uh, the sum of some infinite geometric series. So you have some infinite series, a sum. If you make this sum of all these infinite number of things which are here, so then it turns out to be some finite value. So that is how it is. So this this very concept. See, think of some infinite thing. So it will be infinitesimal contribution. But all this infinitesimal contribution they go on and add up and they point to some number. So this is uh, how this abstract idea of handling is infinite and infinitesimal. So which uh, posed a serious problem in those days. And uh, that's the work of what is known as calculus. Okay? So the Shankara's discussion on uh, binomial series and uh, the sums of powers of integers see, so 1 plus 2 plus 3, 1 square plus 2 square plus 3 square 1 cube plus 2 cube plus 3 cube so what is that? 1 cube plus 2 cube plus 3 cube up to n, n cube remember? Yeah, you have not come across maybe you are there anyway, so this, uh, these things are uh, points and in fact they play a very key role in developing a series for pi. Madhava series for pi. So this uh, pi, so as the students very clearly said, it cannot be expressed with an equality sign. And if it can be expressed as an equality sign, with an equality sign, then it will have an infinite series in the right hand side. So the infinite sum actually contributes here value. So this is what pi is all about. And uh, Madhava has given a series for this, okay, the circumference by diameter. Okay. A series into sum, so you will get the value. And uh, that series is usually described in the literature as Grigory Lewis series. In fact, the series has been given by Madhava most recently before. And historically it would be correct if we call it as Madhava series, if one were to honor the discoverer of total series. Okay. Anyway, so that's another very interesting thing. And uh, this series has very interesting properties and uh, if possible I will uh, discuss that in detail. And the instantaneous velocity, see, this concept of instantaneous velocity something which is encountered by us in all our uh, day to day activities. So we move with a car, so I come from Hawaii uh, to Kari. So overall time taken is say 45 minutes, the distance is some 15 kilometers, so you can divide and say average speed. But instantaneously, so if we were to find out the velocity at various stages, so that itself is a very interesting concept as such. So this arises not necessarily in this context alone, but even in trying to study the motion of planets. 
For instance, so think of eclipse. So very the moon enters the shadow. So slowly it keeps moving. So it actually does move with the uniform speed. See? So the motion of these planets, have you studied Kepler's laws of motion? Planetary motion. So these uh, laws basically tell you that the planet moves in elliptical orbit. And uh, in elliptical orbit, so the speed at which they move is continuously changing. Near Perigee, they will have fastest motion. Composi, they will have as seen by us. Okay? They will have very slow motion. And uh, so this any object in the planetary system is not moving in a circle with uniform velocity. And uh, all these things have to be considered into account when you want to do any computation. So, in fact, uh, in this book, as I saw, so incidentally, let me tell you that. So, that's more important to know. So, there, knowing the details of